Good evening. I'd like to welcome uh, everyone uh, who's here tonight to the, um, and watching as well, to the December 10th, 2014 meeting of the City of Lake Forest Plan Commission. I am Michael Lay, I'm chair of the commission, and I'd like uh, at this time to introduce the other members of the commission who are, are with us this evening. To my far left, <coughs> Commissioner Karras. To my immediate left, uh, Commissioner Culbertson. To my far right is Commissioner Henry. And to my immediate right is Commissioner Berg. Um, from city staff uh, tonight, <coughs> we have uh, Kathy Zerniak. Uh, and uh, in addition to that, uh, the city's consultant on agenda item number three, dealing with the tax increment financing district, uh, <coughs> Lee Brown is with us uh, as well. Um, the first item uh, showing on our agenda is the, um, uh, uh, <coughs> excuse me, the second is considering approval of the minutes. They're not quite ready yet, so we'll defer action on <coughs> taking those up until uh, uh, our next subsequent meeting. Uh, by way of introduction, I would just like to uh, again clarify what we have before us this evening. We have two items. While both of them are related to the Laurel, uh, Laurel Avenue site, they're two separate and distinct agenda items. <clears throat> and uh, the first item is a public hearing, <clears throat> a formal public hearing uh, under the state statutes of the state of Illinois that have to accompany a TIF consideration. We'll be having a public hearing, a presentation and public hearing on that. We're going to have a separate informational presentation on item number four, which is the preliminary information uh, of the site plan, at least the proposed site plan, in very, very preliminary um, presentation this evening. Uh, those of you from the public who are here are welcome to speak on both. Uh, but we would ask that you, if you speak on item number three, confine your remarks, please, just to the question of whether or not a tax increment financing district should be uh, approved or whatever by this plan commission for forwarding to the city council. <clears throat> and then when we get to the public comment portion of agenda item number four, we will take any, anybody who wishes to speak, we would request you fill out a, a, um, a request to speak. You do not have to fill that out. If later on you wish to uh, speak and have not given us a slip, you will still be allowed to provide public comment. So with that, I would ask, uh, uh, whether in taking up item number three, the public hearing and action on the tax and increment financing district, whether any members of the commission have any ex parte contacts or conflicts of interest on the matter of the creation of the tax increment financing district. Seeing none, let the record so show. Um, Let's see, <clears throat> for those who wish to speak, uh, and Lee, I'll get to your presentation, but let's have that first, and then I will swear in those. Or let me, I think I need to swear everybody in, uh, including Lee. Those who want to testify at the public hearing on item number three, the creation of the TIF, would you please, uh, uh, please stand? Okay. Would you <clears throat> raise your right hand, Lee, and this gentleman, um, do you solemnly declare and affirm that the testimony you are about to give or have previously given is true and to the correct of the best of your knowledge? I do. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, Lee Brown from Tesco and Associates. Uh, please proceed, Lee. Mr. Chairman, we have quite a number of slides and I will go through them and ask for questions and comments afterwards. We're going to start with uh, the in a general description of what tax increment financing <coughs> is and how it works, and then we'll get into the specifics of the proposed tax increment financing for Laurel and Western Avenue. 
What is it, Tim? Tax increment financing is an economic development technique that allocates future property taxes from a designated area to pay for project improvements within that area. The program can last up to 23 years. As I said to the Plan Commission recently, the biggest mistake we made was to include the word tax in the description of tax increment financing. It is not a tax. It is not an additional tax. It is not a tax freeze. It is a tool that leverages private investment towards the public purpose. And unlike other economic development tools, the tax rates are the same whether the, it is inside or outside the TIF district. As such, a property owner inside the TIF district or outside the TIF, TIF district would pay the same taxes on the same property. So here is a, an example that we're going to use to try to explain how TIF works. If you can <coughs> assume for a moment that <coughs> before a tax increment district is put in place, the example of having an equalized assessed value, the value that is taxed on the property, is worth a million dollars. The annual taxes, based relatively closely to what the tax rates are in Lake Forest, is about $50,000 a year on, a, on an ex equalized assessed valuation of a million dollars. The TIF district encourages new development, new private development to be constructed within that tax increment district. And once that occurs, in our example, the value increases here to $30 million of equalized assessed value. From that point, once that new value is in place, the taxes that are paid on that $30 million is about $1.5 million a year. That's inclusive of all of the tax districts that impose their property taxes on that property. <coughs> The difference between the $50,000 that was paid before new development occurred and the $1.5 million annually that will be paid from that point forward, the $1,450,000 difference, which we call increment, that incremental difference in annual taxes goes into a TIF fund that's available to pay for project costs. So using this graphic, <coughs> The vertical axis is value. The horizontal axis is time. The intent then is to increase the value of property in the tax district over time. At the beginning of the, of the establishment of the tax increment finance district, the base value of property is determined and established by the county. That base value continues to provide tax base for all of the taxing jurisdictions to share on an annual basis. They tax that existing base. Now, in the TIF district that we're proposing, the existing tax base is quite low because there is on, only one property that is taxed within that area. But over time, the value of the, of the properties within that tax increment district will go up. The difference in any given year is this between the base value and the tax value of that year is collected in a separate fund. That fund is then available to pay for public improvements and the public uh, activities that are used to encourage additional private investment. Once the tax increment district is closed, potentially up to 23 years from the point of adoption of the district, then all of the tax base is available to all of the, taxing, all of the taxing <coughs> jurisdictions and they uh, uh, apply their regular tax rates to that. During the life of the district, there is base value and that is taxed by all the districts, but the incremental value is taxed and collected for a pool of funds available for public improvements. Recognizing that the taxes paid on any property are paid and split off into the several jurisdictions that apply a tax rate, and those include the county, the county college, uh, the
the Lake County Forest Preserve, the Township, the Shields Township, uh, Shields Township Road and Bridge, Lake Forest High School District, Lake Forest School District, the City of Lake Forest, the North Shore Sanitary District. When you add each of their tax levies together, the tax per hundred dollars of EAV, equalized assessed value, is about four and a half dollars for every hundred dollars of value. And you can see then that the city of Lake Forest is about 22, almost 23% of the tax dollar that's paid by an individual property owner. During the life of that TIF district, the incremental value, the entire tax rate is applied to that incremental value and collected for use as to be able to make the costs of improvement. So the real power of the tax increment district is not that it's collecting solely the $1.25 per hundred that the city normally collects as part of the tax rate. It's the collection of all five and a half dollars that's applied to the property for the TIF district. So the intent then is to establish a virtuous cycle in which the public investment in improvements on the site encourages private investment that raises the value of the property. In so doing, it creates additional property <coughs> values that are taxed. Those tax incremental revenues are therefore available to pay for the public improvements that encourages that virtuous cycle of increasing the value in the district. So things to go back and remember as we th work forward towards the proposal in question. First, that the tax increment district does not create any additional tax in terms of the tax rate that's applied to property. The TIF does not freeze any property owner's taxes. They pay their full taxes based on the value that's in place. Any jurisdiction can modify its levy each year within the bounds of the tax caps. That's to say that there are limits that the state has imposed on how much increase can be made to it to a tax rate, but the individual tax jurisdictions have the authority to move their taxes. And then all taxing jurisdictions ultimately benefit by an increased tax base. Tax base. That's the intent, ultimately, is having more tax base available to all of the ta taxing jurisdictions. <coughs> What can TIF be used for? The TIF funds are used for eligible project costs that benefit the district and eliminate the impediments to redevelopment. And that typically includes things like public utilities and streetscape and road improvements, environmental cleanup of site, property assembly, putting multiple properties together and making them available for redevelopment, project financing, but it's not for the direct funding of private buildings. That's not what TIF does. TIF does the public improvements that attract the private investment in buildings. What establishes the qualifications that we can put a TIF in place? The TIF Act includes three basic alternatives that are <coughs> make it available for eligibility. The first one's called blighting conditions. The second is conservation conditions. <coughs> And the third is industrial park conservation conditions. They're different physical s situations. But the two that are probably applicable that we're discussing tonight are either blighting or conservation. And they have characteristics that are defined in the statute. The use of TIF, uh, now it's, there exceeds 1,500 TIF districts around the state. This is a map of the Chicago metropolitan area itself. Uh, I'll, I'll explain it because uh, the colors are not as brilliant as they were on my, on my computer. The areas in white within the uh, seven counties of the Chicago metropolitan area are not uh, municipalities and therefore tax increment districts can't be put in place there. Uh, the areas that are in the uh, dark gray tone shown in the, on the bottom left corner are areas that do not have tax, municipalities that don't currently have tax districts. All of the colored areas in blue tones are municipalities that have tax increment districts in place. And they range in 
in value from less than 1% of the total value of the community up to uh, more than 55% in certain districts, certain municipalities, have the majority of their value within tax increment districts. And that has created probably the greatest concern amongst um, observers around the state of about the percentage that any given TIF district might have of the total value of the community's tax base. Where has it been done? Well, let's call your attention to the fact that the city of Lake Forest has successfully established, uh, encouraged the development of a TIF and closed the TIF district on in West Lake Forest. And it had <coughs> values that went well above $50 million uh, before it was closed um, in 2013, I believe, 2012 or 2013. Uh, as comparable examples, downtown Evans, Evanston itself has five TIF districts, but the downtown TIF district now exceeds $65 million of incremental value that was constructed. Uh, and that's, that's taxable value, not simply the market value. Uh, Deerfield has a couple of TIF districts now exceeding $35 million. Libertyville, another example of, of $27 million in their tax increment district. Um, the red line that you see uh, sort of on the lower quarter of that bar chart is what the anticipated value that was uh, thought to potentially occur in the Westlake Forest TIF district when it was established. So it was established in 1988 and the, and the value of that district was about $2 million and it was intended uh, through development to rise to something of about $19 million by the end of the life of that district. Well, in fact, the district was much more successful than we imagined. And so at the peak, uh, before the decline in property values across the community, the, the district value exceeded $55 million of equalized assessed value. Very successful, and all of this, everything above this point in 1988, all of these values in any given year were available for the TIF district to spend money to encourage uh, investment by private investors in that area. So it was a quite successful uh, TIF district. <clears throat> now, before you this evening, in, in this public hearing, uh, we are proposing the establishment of a tax increment district, a second tax increment, a, a tax increment district, uh, the first one being uh, the Westlake Forest is closed, that no longer exists. So this is the area in question. Uh, there is a black line that shows right here. It's 10.6 acres in area, not counting the right of way on the perimeter. And those are included within the TIF district because public improvements can occur in that right of way. Um, so on the north, on the north boundary would be the Franklin Place right of way. On the east boundary would be the Western Avenue right of way up against the railroad right of way. On the south boundary of the south boundary of, of Laurel Avenue, and the western edge of this district is the current west property line of the city-owned uh, municipal services facility, the line separated from single-family homes directly to the west. 10.6 acres, 13 total parcels, seven existing structures. The current uh, use you're seeing in a series of existing vacant municipal buildings here, the uh, largest section in the middle vacant uh, since the closure of the, of the Knauss uh, facilities. One single family home on parcel number uh, 019 right here. With the exception of that one single family home, the remainder, including the right of ways, are owned by the city of Lake Forest. The tax increment finance law, the act as it's known, uh, indicates a series of eligibility criteria that are evaluated on each site before it is uh, proposed for eligibility. The findings on, this, on these properties is that 
each of the buildings that are in place exceed the 35 years uh, in age. That would, that would matter most if what we were looking for was the conservation uh, criteria. The conservation criteria is that, 35, uh, that the majority of buildings exceed 35 years in age and <coughs> three or more of the conditions ex exist that are uh, indicated as criteria. Well, in fact, uh, since we have more than five criteria present, then we no longer need the pr presence of that age criteria. So if you look at obsolescence, deterioration, excessive vacancies of, of buildings, lack of community planning, environmental remediation, and the loss of relative decline in, loss or relative decline in equalized assessed value as being the criteria that were found to be present to a meaningful extent throughout the site. Uh, the, the last one, uh, that relative decline in equalized assessed value relates to how the property values within the proposed district compare to changes in property values throughout the city as a whole. The chart indicates that for uh, four out of the five most recent years, not only did the property value within the district decline, now basically this is the one property that is that is not within the city's uh, control. Not only did the property value decline in each of the five years, but it declined in four out of the five years at a faster rate than the total decline throughout the rest of the city. The comprehensive plan that was most recently adopted in 1998 includes goals and objectives for residential character and development. They, uh, they specifically provide a land use pattern that takes into consideration the need for transitional zoning and is sensitive to unique land characteristics. It also calls for us to maintain high standards in all new development and rehabilitation, including <coughs> infill developments, giving special consideration to the unique character of each area of the city. It goes on to indicate that the proposed, that this area, specifically Laurel and Western, the properties that we're speaking of, are indicated within what's called a transition zone, areas that buffer between different land uses and or densities, additionally those areas that may be subject to redevelopment. And in speaking to that, sets forth standards for the quality and character of, of the land uses in that area. The redevelopment plan that is proposed before you tonight anticipates a predominantly residential area that contributes to the health and vitality of the city of Lake Forest <coughs> and strengthens the demand for goods and services within the adjacent central business district. It recommends land uses, redevelopment opportunities, and public improvements of this redevelopment plan as anticipated it is consistent with the comprehensive plan. Within the document that's before you, the redevelopment plan and program is a proposed budget. This budget would stand as the basis for decision making going forward. The most important part of that budget is that estimated project cost limit of $31 million that's in the, in the summary at the bottom. Each of the individual line items allows the city to execute decisions about public improvements and provides the authority to to do that. Now in reality, in the 13th year or the 15th year or whatever decision point comes across, the value on the right side amounts to a placeholder. That is that we care most about the total of value on the bottom line. They can move, the city can make choices about moving uh, improvements within those line items as shown. Why? We can't predict the future for 23 years, but we can predict limits to the amount that the city should be using for improvements. And so that $31 million is not dependent on the proposed development that will be brought before the city that you'll hear uh, its initial summary tonight. The TIF district as proposed is independent of whether or not the developers that will be before you tonight receive their approvals for development. This TIF district would be put in place to allow for the improvement and the remediation of the site and to assemble the property so that it can be developed by this developer or any developer going forward. So that's one of the reasons that we have two separate events tonight. One is specifically about the TIF district and it is independent about who or what the development would occur. 
what would we hope for the outcomes of the tax increment financing district? First, the, el the elimination or alleviation of eligibility criteria. So the, the physical features of a decaying set of buildings, the, um, the mitigation of environmental conditions, which we have received uh, technical data related to a phase two environmental evaluation that shows contamination on the site and physical conditions of, of uh, unconsolidated soil that require considerable amount of public expense to create what is a developable site. Ultimately, we hope to see the construction of and occupancy of residential redevelopment. That's consistent with the comprehensive plan. That's consistent with the development guidelines that you reviewed and uh, recommended. We would hope to see a substantial increase in the tax base for this property. Uh, its current assessed valuation is $96,000, $96,630. The estimates is that redevelopment of the property can achieve new development exceeding $30 million in value. That's assessed value, meaning that the property value, the market value, is three times that. The growth in annual property taxes based on that additional property value, would, which is currently at about $4,800 per year, is likely to be $1.5 million per year in, in tax base. Now, during the life of the TIF district, that $1.5 million, once, it's put, once the value is put in place with new construction, would be collected to be able to pay off the improvements that would encourage that development beyond the life of the TIF district after it is closed, whether that is shy of 23 years or up to 23 years, that $1.5 million would therefore be shared by all the taxing jurisdictions on their regular tax levy. There's quite a bit there, and I'm, I'm certain that there are questions, and I will take your questions. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Let's see, I think, <clears throat> why don't we go, Kathy, do you want to comment on the issues first and then we'll come back to you, <clears throat> uh, Mr. Brown? Sure, thank you, Chairman Lay. Just a few brief comments. Um, <clears throat> this is really a ne next step in what has been a very long process. Uh, the city has planned for the redevelopment of the Western Laurel Avenue site for, for many years. Um, in 2007, 2008, the uh, city conducted community visioning sessions. Uh, as an outcome of those sessions, development parameters were put together. Uh, due to the economy, the city council decided to step back from redevelopment of the site for a few years. In 2012, uh, the city council directed the plan commission to revisit the development parameters, which you did at a public hearing, recommended some changes, and those changes were accepted by the city council. Um, in reviewing those development parameters and in recognizing that uh, redevelopment of this site is now a high priority for the City Council, uh, the sense is that the time is right. Uh, the City Council spent a lot of time considering whether a, a TIF district would be appropriate for this site. Um, they explored the success of the TIF district on the west side of the community along Waukegan Road. Uh, they heard, they learned uh, about the basics of TIF, much as, as you have done um, over a series of meetings. <clears throat> and the City Council really felt that it was worthwhile to bring consideration of the TIF district forward. Uh, and the Council really sees the TIF district as a tool that will really make possible quality development on this site. The TIF district really uh, is something that that will support the development of this site because it will assist the city in demolishing the buildings. We know there is some co contamination in the soil. We know that there are some unstable soils on the property. We know that some of the uh, public utilities in the area, some of the public rights of way need some improvement. Um, <coughs> and there are other ways that the TIF revenues can be used to support quality development. Um, after having that discussion, the city council wanted to proceed that's why the plan commission has been asked to hold a public hearing on the TIF district. In your staff report, it's a very brief staff report given the material put together by the city's consultant, but you do have a recommendation in support of the TIF district and there's a series of findings. Those are really a summary, a, a short summary of the findings that were presented by, by Lee Brown. Um, with that, you are 
conducting a public hearing tonight, it is appropriate to take public comment, public questions, certainly ask questions of Mr. Brown. Uh, at the close of your public hearing, if you choose to do so, it would be appropriate to forward a recommendation on this matter to the City Council. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Um, let's see, <clears throat> since we only have at least as far as I can tell, one person who's asked to speak on, in the public hearing. I think let's go to questions for Mr. Brown and then <clears throat> uh, deal with that and then we'll go to public hearing. Are there any questions of, uh, of the presenter uh, or the city's consultant on this matter? I have one. Uh, Lee, you, you mentioned uh, the use of funding <clears throat> for basic, essentially public improvements. And then you, you also said that it's not funding for private buildings of any sort, whether they would be residential, commercial, what have you. You want to just expand on that a little bit? Well, the intent is for the, for the funds to eliminate physical and financial conditions that make it impractical to develop. The market isn't uh, respecting the site and isn't encouraging development on its own. And so what you need to do as a city is eliminate those conditions. Some of that is the, the clearance of the, of the building. Some of that is the elimination of the, of the uh, toxic conditions or the underground um, uh, environmental uh, conditions that need to be remediated. But the law does not allow you to spend money to construct a new building, with, with an exception, that is, for what's, what meets the standards of affordable housing at the state level, and that's not being proposed here, um, it is possible to use funds to assist a developer to build affordable housing. That's not, that's not what uh, this is proposed to do. So it isn't that you can build a building and then hand it off to someone uh, as a private uh, owner of a building. You can't use those funds that way. It's to prepare the site and make it ready for private investment. Okay, thank you. Miss, I, I have a question, Mr. Chairman. Um, on day one of year one of the establishment of the TIF, uh, there are no funds, there are no incremental funds available to the public fund. So how do we get the virtuous circle going by funding some of these public improvements that are meant to encourage private investment? There are communities that use what's called the pay-as-you-go plan which is to say they can take some monies out of pocket and build a road, clear a site, make it available, and wait for the new development to generate on an annual basis the taxes that come in with the increment. Uh, that works so long as the improvements at, that you can afford those improvements in the be beginning. But you're, you're pointing out to the fact that what's needed here is a much more serious investment in public improvements to encourage that private investment it is very likely that the city would borrow funds to be able to make the public improvements. And then the incremental taxes that are received on an annual basis pay off the debt service for that. So you see in this budget, there's a line item number six, financing costs. Up to $7 million is shown here to pay for the financing of debt to be able to put in public improvements. Um, that's part of the reason that there is up to 23 years in the, in the statute, because it was assumed that municipalities would get things going in about the first three years, and that 20 years was available for retirement of debt. That's the typical time that, that bonds are sold for a 20-year period. So the anticipation is that this is not something you're going to do out of pocket. It is something that you, that the city would incur debt for <coughs> and use the, uh, the incremental annual revenues to pay off that debt. And part of that uh, means that the life of the district uh, is, is elongated, if you will, to be able to pay off that debt over time. And part of that goes to the point in, uh, in 7.5 and 7.7, .7, school district increase due to additional students. The statute anticipate, the legislature anticipated there was a time that students would be generated in homes in a given uh, TIF district. Rather than hold the school districts uh, for the cost of providing school services over the life of the district, 
there are payments that are, ma are made from the incremental revenues to the school district if there are students that are generated during that time frame. So there is, there is a, a formula in the statute, and it's applied here in our estimates, uh, to be able to support if there are students. Now we, of course, uh, have to make some assumptions about how, much, how many homes might be uh, on the area and how many students would be in those dwellings and what the costs of providing services uh, through the two different school districts. Those projections add up to uh, a figure. The statute caps that for each school district on the basis uh, in total of about 40% of the total revenues in any given year uh, available through the revenue. I add, add one thing sure, in response, um, Commissioner Culbertson. Um, I think another important aspect of this TIF district that makes it different from any other TIF districts is that currently, with the exception of that one small property, uh, this property is not generating any tax revenues at all. So upon the sale, upon the transfer of this property to a private individual or private uh, party, that will immediately generate some increment. So that makes this TIF district different than, than most. And certainly different from the West Lake Forest TIF district. Right. Okay. Got questions. Go um, could, you, uh, could you expound upon the administration of the TIF if it's approved? Um, administration is... Uh, and governance. In essence, the city is responsible to assure that the TIF district is uh, performing on the, on the statutory requirements. There are annual meetings that are required. There's an annual report and audit that are required of the TIF district. Uh, the annual meeting is before what's called the Joint Review Board. The Joint Review Board is made up of the other taxing jurisdictions, including the city of Lake Forest, to oversee uh, basically two things, that the, that the TIF district remains, uh, according to the statutory requirements, making public improvements that are eligible and that the revenues that are available uh, will cover the costs of those improvements. So that there is a oversight through that JRB. The other part of this is that by adopting the TIF, it does not authorize public improvements directly. The City Council will have to authorize individual public improvements, authorize them typically through ordinances at the time that they are found to be necessary. So in adopting this, the City of Lake Forest is not committed to spending $31 million. Those will be indi individual commitments along the way. Okay, to a maximum then of 31? Million? Well, the statute calls for uh, essentially cost of living increase over that $31 million. Right. It, and it allows for up to 5% increase above that. But that's basically a cap that would be uh, on the basis of the projected income increment that will be available. Okay. And, and there were some different, thank you. There's some differences between the West Lake Forest and this, this TIF district. That was a much larger piece of property. Much larger piece of property and perhaps more importantly unknown in its uh, rate of improvement or the, or the kinds of Longer things. period of time of It took a longer period of time and a lot of additional work to make property available for redevelopment. Uh, this is a consolidated site or it would be once the TIF district uh, assembles uh, all of the property. It's 10.6 acres. Um, it is intended uh, to be developed by a single developer. It is intended to meet the development design standards that you review and approve. And so it's likely to be a much more uh, understandable and complete project as a single project rather than waiting for it to happen over a series of years. Right, so suffice it to say that a, a number of these expenditures such as the property assembly, acquisition, land, and other property, that line item in particular, as well as a few others, will be, will be incurred early in the process. Yes, it would likely occur uh, relatively in that three-year period that uh, we typically see the most public improvements will occur in, in short order, uh, given the likelihood that we can use the developer that has been selected uh, or that development um, occurs based on the market conditions. We can't predict that uh, the homes will be built as fast as we'd like them to be built or that they will be absorbed uh, at that same rate. But this is a reasonable estimate of timing. 
Okay. And then if there's, so for example, the largest line item here is the school district increase. That would mean additions to Deer Path School or to Lake Forest Heights, whatever it may be. Well, actually, these are not capital expenses. Those okay. are operating expenses. There is operating a line expenses. in there that's available for capital improvements, but it's minor. And, it, and those uh, dollars that are available for the school district, both school districts, and also for library, is based on increases of real costs based on additional students or additional uh, users of the library. Those are operating expenses for those uh, taxing bodies, not capital costs. Okay, because... That's the legislation? That's or the is, legislation. So there's no need for, is there a need potentially for additional capital expenditures my understanding to the is schools that there is if not there's an increase in student based, count? Uh, my understanding is that there is capacity. Uh, we're not talking about generating a lot of students. Um, now, I'm, I'm going to forget the number, but it was less than 24 total students that were an okay. anticipated. So it is not likely that they will need capital improvements. West, Lit, West Lake Forest Tift District included capital improvements for the school district. Um, that is not what's anticipated. But we're not accounting that. for that here. That's correct. Okay. We could if it was if it's we It's available. It was it's a line item. We could if it's necessary. Okay. Not to, not to belabor the point. As you know, from our last public hearing, as you know, my biggest concern is doing this, issuing bonds, the debt we talked about, and then not having the residual value to then go ahead and collect taxes to pay that back. Um, could you walk us through in a little bit more detail just that process over, say, the first 10 years of a project that would be uh, put on this property? Uh, clearly, there's a, there's a time difference between when uh, the ground is cleared, uh, foundations are put in, buildings are raised ocup and occupied. Sure. Uh, before there is tax revenues received by the city. So there's a time lag in that period. Uh, if the project takes three to five years to build out, then the revenue stream will increase. Perhaps the best way of, of going back is, is this graphic that said, over a period of time, the values went up. <clears throat> now, in our projections, we have shown extraordinarily low amounts of what's called appreciation in value. We're not, we're not reliant on the values of an individual building going up because market values go up. What we're showing are uh, estimates of revenue based on real construction value and real market value being put in place. New construction. New construction. Um, <clears throat> over time, uh, it is likely that we would be borrowing money up front to, first things first, clean up the site. Uh, that's a combination of the physical removal of buildings, the removal of the soil conditions. Remediation, and, right. And remediation right. that goes with that. Mm -hmm. The public improvements for road and uh, other amenities that go along with the roadway improvements. That's up front to make the site essentially development ready. By doing so, the city can sell the property to the developer. The developer then is uh, putting buildings in place that raise the value to pay for those public improvements in the beginning, it's likely that the city would borrow funds. And so there's, within the estimates, the ability to pay for those, uh, the borrowing of that funds by incremental revenues alone, which is to say it's intended to be funded entirely by the improvements and by private taxpayers who ultimately will own that, rather than putting any burden on the city of Lake Forest or it's the larger tax base. Okay. And then my last question around that, that uh, first, well, the line item number two, property assembly, $7.9 million. Those estimates have been vetted with environmental experts and uh, demolition people, grading people, all those experts helped establish those numbers. That's correct. And they were also uh, evaluated against projections that were made for incremental increases in value. And then the, and the Unknowns, property contingencies. I'm sorry. Is there some contingency in that money as well? Yes, there's contingency. I mean, we're we're using estimates that are uh, conservative, and the hope would be that we can uh, make those public improvements at a, an amount less than what's in that. Okay. Thank you. Other questions of uh, 
Mr. Brown? I have one. <clears throat> so the public improvements include any roadways that might be put on the site. And more roadways, less roadways, I mean, that's it's totally up to the development plan to dictate what, what that amount of blacktop would be and curbing and so forth. Would that include sidewalks as well and various amenities like that? Or does that depend on the nature of how the de developer wants to approach? So some, some developments have private roadways. Absolutely. And, and I was wondering too, when you answer that, is, is, is it possible that, that the TIF can be used to put the roadways in and, and at some particular time have those roadways transferred over to private ownership? Theoretically, so long as we maintain a public way, meaning public accessibility, a right of way without necessarily being the underlying ownership, yes, the public improvements can be made so long as the public remains <coughs> so that the property is accessible through those. Now, we need to keep in mind that what we're doing is putting in place a TIF district that would work for the city of Lake Forest, whether it's this developer or any future developers. Uh, we can't be dependent on the projections here being solely for this development. So recognizing that, we're including line items that make it a, uh, appropriate for us to make public improvements for access, but not necessarily exactly what the developer may be proposing to you as part of their development proposal. I, I was thinking also in terms of <coughs> what we might want to impose on the developer as far as roadways. Does it benefit the developer in the sense that if we say we would like more roadway or roadway here, roadway there, if we're going to be able to actually say to them, we can use the TIF to help finance this as a means to maybe make the developer more acceptable to those ideas? TIF is available, particularly when we can show that there is enough value to pay for those public improvements. That's an eligible expense. The, uh, the budget allows for that to be, for roadways to be on site, to be public roadways or publicly accessible roadways and to be paid for by the TIF. I have one more sure, question. Go ahead, uh, Lloyd. If I, if I understand this correctly, your projections estimate that you'll, uh, you'll, you'll, that we'll, that we'll gather about $30 million worth of taxes, which will equal just about the 30. No, the $30 million is equalized assessed valuation right. above and beyond. So but, the, the, uh, if you, if you wanted to at say the end of the, the 20, $1.5 million right. a year for 20 or 23 years, yes, there's, right. that's the, that's the assumption. Okay. So is this, is it, is, this is meant to match the $31 million? Or they just happen to be Is that a coincidence? Or it's or coincidence. Is, it's coincidence. Yes. It's not. It's, so it is based on a rational uh, analysis That's of, correct. of your projections. Okay. I thought it was quite it interesting is that it's coincidental. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Seeing no further questions, uh, Mr. Brown, um, thank you very much. I <clears throat> appreciate your... Uh, your um, clarity and we'll now move to the public testimony on <clears throat> agenda item number three uh, regarding the, the uh, creation of the TIF district. Uh, I noticed that we have at least one gentleman. Uh, I would ask him to come forward at this time and uh, please state, give us your name and uh, address and your testimony. If you could limit it please to uh, to five minutes uh, as the rules of the commission, we would appreciate that. Paul Hammond, 511 Beverly, 56 year resident of Lake Forest. Something that you didn't discuss was uh, the uh, city had passed something indicated that they could uh, sell $18.5 million worth of bonds. Um, what people aren't looking at is the issue of a capital cost and an operating cost as far as uh, property taxes and the schools. Um, if you look as far as a few years ago, uh, when East Campus was expanded, we spent $54 million for 27 classrooms or about $2 million a classroom. 
if you look as far as impact fees for the city, the city has impact fees of $20,000 per housing unit. When you use that $2 million a classroom, the impact fees should be $50,000. So each new housing unit, which is added in Lake Forest, we're short $30,000 because of that capital cost. People say, but I pay the property tax for the schools, but that's for the operating and not the capital. So every new housing unit, we lose $30,000. Basically, I look at a TIF as being a slush fund. There's no free lunch. The city is still using that facility for salt storage and for hockey fences during the summer, so it is being used. So to me, the city is going to be losing $18.5 million because they're going to be sliding the money out from the operating and force the schools to do more with less. So I'm basically against this uh, TIF fund. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for your testimony. <clears throat> uh, anyone else wish to speak as part? Yes, sir. Please uh, come up. Good, good evening. My name is Richard Wood. I live at 1032 Northwestern Avenue, otherwise known as Regents Row in Lake Forest. Um, I am totally open-minded, as I hope all of you are, to, to what I'm hearing tonight. I did not know a lot about TIF districts and still don't. But I would commend to you to watch one video that I watched. It was two years ago tomorrow, presented by the Kellogg School of Management to the, I think it was the city council, but certainly some important board of Evanston. They spent a semester, four, four of the Kellogg students, studying TIF districts and did what I thought in an hour was an excellent job of presenting that. I will present for the record the link to that site and the four recommendations they made. The recommendations looking at them alone are pretty opaque, so you really need to look at what they said. Based on what I've heard tonight, I, I, you know, I, I think we saw presented an excellent presentation for successful TIFs. I think it's worthwhile to look at some unsuccessful TIFs and see, you know, there's got to be both sides to the story. Um, that having been said, I'm a little surprised to hear I live so close to a blighted district, but be that as it may, um, I, I, in, in the course of the last few weeks, I've had the occasion to run into two people who are in city government in other cities other than Lake Forest, and I mentioned TIFs. They had all done them, and I mentioned the fact that this was city-owned property, and, and they went blank. They said, and, and they just had no answer. So I, I think we need to look at how many times it's been owned by city-owned property. The other thing I think that needs to be explored is the fact that developers in this city are typically asked to do a lot of the public improvements that it appears to me on first instance, now we're asking the city to do. So how does that weigh into the price the city is getting for the property? It should be higher if the developer isn't having to do a lot of what a developer typically does. So these are the questions that I'm thinking about and I hope they're the questions that you'll get answers to as you deliberate. So thank you very much. <clears throat> thank you very much, Mr. Wood. Um, Additional testimony? Did I hear somebody over here? Okay, thank you. I'm Richard Cottrell. I live across the street from this project at 119 East Laurel Avenue, and I have a dental office at 133 East Laurel Avenue. I'm not uh, opposed or for a TIF district. I question the funding of this TIF, uh, TIF district because it seems to be based on a rather bloated plan for the redevelopment of this project. So the question I have is how much leeway do you have to pay off the TIF if you only generate $20 million rather than $30 million in the appraised uh, property? You have one building here, from what I can see, that's four stories plus a roof that makes it as tall as the clock tower 
in Market Square. And I can't believe that that's finally going to fly. And if it doesn't fly, how does that affect the TIF financing? It's, it's just a common sense question that I think we all have to ask. You also have no guest parking on this site. It is maximized to the point of apparently paying off this TIF. And the question is, if this isn't approved, what happens to the TIF funding? And I think we all have to really have an answer to that question. And we will ask uh, our consultant to address that at the end of the public hearing. <clears throat> Additional testimony? Uh, <clears throat> Lee, can I have you come back? Can you address that question the gentleman just asked? I think part of the answer is that, as I indicated, the adoption of the TIF by the City Council does not commit to borrowing the money. It does not commit for the cost of improvement. It allows for that commitment to be made in a series of steps over time. The judgment uh, in any individual improvement will be on the basis of whether there is a reasonable expectation that the funds will be there. Uh, we have used conservative estimates of the value of construction and we have done that both independent of the proposal that will be before you uh, and reasonable expectations about value uh, on an acreage basis of what could be constructed. So we wanted to look at it whether or not this is the developer and this is the development. The site still needs to be cleaned up. <coughs> the site still needs to be prepared for development if the city is successful in encouraging private investment of the site. Uh, we are all wary of making a commitment of borrowing of funds unless it can be repaid by the increment. But this is the nature of tax increment financing. It is a, a commitment to encourage private investment, but it can only be done by eliminating the impediments to real market conditions. So again, we're not proposing to borrow all that money all up front on the basis of either a whim or a expectation that the development will come. There will be a series of steps along the way in which we examine whether or not uh, the funding that is expected at that given time will pay for the improvements that are requested. Okay. Thanks for clarifying <clears throat> and responding to the question. Could I ask him to answer? Sure. Uh, could you answer the question about city-owned property as a TIF? Is Most TIFs before? during some period will be held by the city in order to uh, provide the kind of incentive that is common to reducing the cost of acquiring that property. Many TIFs don't start with uh, largely owned city property, but many do. Um, it's, uh, it's quite common for the city to acquire the property in a series of steps over time to try to make that available. And then when, uh, given that we try to keep the the period of development and collection of the tax increment to a limited time. Nobody wants to have the TIF district run on uh, for any longer than it needs to be in place because the city wants to take advantage of the increases in tax uh, revenue just like all the other taxing jurisdictions. So it is common to time the TIF district to the point where we think that the market will be able to respond timely. So it's common for properties to be held either in part or uh, in whole by the city during the life of the district. If I could just make one comment. Sure. I, th I think it's very important that, that everyone understands what the process that we're, we're deliberating about today. It's about the plan commission making a recommendation to the city council. I think we have a lot of pronoun reference problems about who's deciding what and details about the, the specific development that's in question. That's not what we're talking about. I think Mr. Wood brings up a very, very important distinction that really doesn't apply to what we're considering tonight. And it's a, if, if we want to encourage private investment on this site that's been um, consistent with the comprehensive plan that was last talked about in 1998, and without the, this um, TIF district financing and the in resulting improvements that come from this financing, um, it's very difficult, if not impossible, to consider that anything can happen with the site. So when they're asking the plan commission 
to make a recommendation on, on this particular site, we're really talking about the tool of the TIF district. Very, very separate from the details of the development. So really what I, I, what I would encourage everybody to consider, and as a commission, I think we very much share the concerns about the details that none of the plan commission has been privy to. The purchase and sale agreement, the details, it's, it's eight line items as the budget for a $31 million development is not nearly enough detail or information for us to talk about the, the probability or the, the financial prudence of this development. And what we're talking about is, is this tool something we want to consider for that development? So I think that if we boil it down to what we're talking about, the details no one, no one on the plan commission is privy to, all of these decisions are ultimately going to be made by the city council. They ask us to be the to give them a recommendation, and we're talking about. I think Kathy's term was the tool of the TIF district. My term is the vehicle with which we get this site funded. So I've been involved in many, many um, tax increment finance real estate transactions, and what the council is asking this commission to do is to recommend the use of this vehicle to actually move. If you, I recommend everybody maybe who's concerned about it, just take a walk around the site and look what's there. We have a new beautiful municipal services building. Um, timing aside on how that was built, um, I encourage you to look up the numbers of what that building cost to be built. Let's talk about the here and now and what we're being asked to do, which is to make a recommendation to the city council about this vehicle, this funding mechanism, a TIF district. Is it something that we want to consider to proactively deal with this site. And before we get to that question, I would like to ask one last time if there's anyone else who wishes to uh, appear in public testimony before we close the public hearing on this matter. Yes, sir. Yeah, can I ask one question? Would you go there? Or yes, please. Your and give us your name, address, and, and you can ask your question. <clears throat> My name is David Feller. I live at 40 Thomas Place. Um, the question I have really is a follow-up to the other gentleman's question, which was, what happens if the revenues do not generate to the extent that it's been envisioned in this budget? I don't believe that question was answered. Um, I, if, you, if, for example, we were having this conversation in 2004, I believe that the revenue projections <coughs> would have been very good in terms of tax uh, incremental tax gains. As we all know, in 2008, the bottom fell out of the market, and those estimates, I suspect, would have been sadly wrong. So I think the question still remains, what happens if the city does not generate the amount of tax that it needs to pay off any borrowings? Thank you. Sure. Lee? <clears throat> It is likely that the borrowing for this would be staged in parts so that we don't commit to all of the necessary funds if not all of the development will occur. But if it is, uh, if the borrowing occurs and the values do not go up, whether lack of construction or lack of, of uh, marketability of what's constructed, then ultimately you have up to 23 years to collect uh, revenues to pay off debt. But if that's not available, then it is a city responsibility to pay off its debt with funds other than TIF. But that's not uh, a decision that either you or the city council wants to make. And that's why we have proposed it in a way that would phase the funding of it so that that commitment can be based on realistic assumptions about the market conditions that exist. Okay, <clears throat> with that, uh, seeing no further questions, uh, uh, I will declare the public hearing on this matter closed, and um, we can then move to, uh, uh, Kathy, did you have any further staff response? Okay, um, then I would ask uh, commission discussion and comment. Just to start off the deliberations, uh, Mr. Chairman, if we were to recommend to City Council that we are in favor of the TIF, 
that doesn't mean by it doesn't mean that anything is actually going to happen. They're not going to go out and run and do a TIF next Monday when they meet again. The city Council will just know that we are in, we're recommending them that to to use this, utilize this as we move forward. And then that in hand, we can go ahead and over whatever period of time review this developers or someone you know else's <laughs> with the idea that we have TIF as in our pocket to use if we think it so well coordinates with their proposal, correct? That's correct. So we really aren't committing to anything by this recommendation. It just allows us to move forward with more. And the council will take it up uh, in a time period that it uh, sees fit that matches whatever discussions that are going to go on with a developer or another developer or whatever in due course. Mr. Chairman. Yes. Uh, once your recommendation goes to them, they have a window in which to make a decision. A okay. window is not less than 14 days, not longer than 90 days to make a decision on whether to adopt the TIF. Thank you very much. Thank you for the clarification. Okay, we have before us a... Um, I have another question yes. with regard to that answer though. So if they decide not to do anything, then the TIF isn't isn't put into motion, isn't 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 activated, correct? If they don't act within that ninety days, uh, there is no TIF in place. Okay. So can we re uh, can we re entertain the idea yes, six you months can. later? So really it's still the, the, the idea is we have our options open, <coughs> right? They'd have to go through another public hearing and yeah. That's so correct. Forth. Hopefully, we enjoy that. So, yeah. Yeah. so we get we've got the uh, the recommendations in the one and a half page uh, uh, handout that was provided us, including the recommendation to approve uh, the establishment of TIF, and subject to which include and is based upon four findings. That uh, really is a summarization of what was in the the program and the plan and the extensive uh, study that Tesca did for the city on this matter. So I'm open to a motion uh, if the uh, commission is so inclined. I might be more interested in just somehow amending our recommendation that it's noted that we um, don't feel that we're, we're uh, informed to the point to make anything other than uh, an informed decision on that we understand the tool and how it works and how it works on this site, but we're not familiar with the, the details of the deal or the development, and the deal meaning the sale of the property. I'm not sure that's necessary. Th that that condition need be added? I would just say I can't, rec I can't recommend that the, the TIF district makes sense. I don't even know what the sale price is for the land. Well, I think that's yet to come. I think that's yet to come, and that would be part of, I would assume that that information would be known to us uh, at the time that we then would make a recommendation on any site plan or development that would, would follow. Sure. So. I would say I do agree with uh, Commissioner Henry on, on those details. Um, again, my concern is the point, uh, and I think the re reliability of the information is um, strong. I think the due diligence has been there. I'm just really concerned on this potential of the, the cities being on the hook for the debt without really knowing some of the additional details. So caution to me is um, in this regard is probably advisable. Well, let's get the matter before us. We can't vote maybe on this, guys. Chairman Lay, your, your motion could certainly uh, recognize the, the plan commission's role in all this, uh, much <coughs> as described by Commissioner Henry. It is not inappropriate for you to acknowledge that the financial aspects of the deal rest with the City Council and not with the Plan Commission. So in crafting your motion, you could certainly um, include that, that you have focused on the use of 
the TIF district as a tool, uh, looking at, um, as the findings in your staff report indicate, whether or not this site is appropriate, whether it meets the blighted uh, requirement, whether the redevelopment plan, the concept presented in the redevelopment plan is consistent with the comprehensive plan. Those are really the pieces, the land use related pieces that the plan commission is looking at. Um, so certainly many of your comments could be incorporated into, an, into a motion. That would be acceptable. Are you guys me. comfortable with that? That would be acceptable sure. to me. You, yeah. you want this to be a vehicle, a tool. I'm not opposed to it being a vehicle. I'm just concerned that if we appropriate, if there's an appropriation of $31 million and it can't be paid for, I, I don't know enough now sitting here to recommend that that be done. Right. And so a, I think vehi Jim, a vehicle, yes. And I think we're not being asked to opine on that and make a recommendation on that. As Kathy mentioned, it's consistency with the plan and all of the, not all, but the four findings that go with the staff recommendation. That's it, and, and I believe that's what the commissioner is saying, yeah. right? Not to put words, words in your mouth, no, but at least that was my I, interpretation. And I would take it even farther to say that I, I, I mentioned in my other statement that I believe that it, it's consistent with the comprehensive plan and it's, it's consistent with the other four points that they made, but if they're right. asking our recommendation, I, I, I recommend that the, the vehicle and the understanding of this, this finance district makes, uh, is understood and I recommend it to be considered, but I'm not gonna recommend that I know enough about the, the details of, of a, the, a particular site and a, that comes with a budget attached to it that uh, that's and that's not what's before us. Today. That's not. I, I don't see it that way either. Okay. Yeah. Well, provided as as we said, we do that sort of carve out where it's it's cautionary and noted. Then I would support this as a vehicle. Okay. A potential vehicle. But I'm I'm open to whatever you would suggest. Let's move it. Um, so to specifically state that we are not embracing any capital project correct with specificity correct is that is that fair sure would you like me and that to was take the context of my and frankly I'm sorry that? would that you like me to take a stab at yeah I summarizing would. your comments can i make one comment though that was the context of my question around the governance as well there is a board that is established that will govern the spend um who is charged with making sure before they spend the Twenty million dollars, or well, it's thirty-one total, but I think it was twelve million on schools, the operation of the schools. That they review that and look at the EAV increase and determine whether or not it's worth spending at that point. And I'm confident that the statute covers that, and the the math is already in place. In the specific case of the school district, it's an annual request by the school district with evidence of the number of students. It is not across the board. Here's the amount. So it's proven up. It's proven each year. Kathy, could we hear your... I'll, I'll take a stab at what I think I, I heard from all of you. Sure. Um, the Plan Commission recommends to the City Council approval of a tax increment financing district for the Laurel and Western Avenue site as a vehicle for supporting redevelopment of the site uh, based on the findings included in the staff report and as detailed by the city's consultant, Lee Brown, uh, this recommendation is forwarded with the understanding that the city council will conduct all appropriate due diligence to assure that the financial aspects of the deal uh, limit risk to the city and provide the anticipated benefit. So moved. Second it. It's been moved and seconded. Discussion on the motion. Any discussion, debate? I, I think this is Sounds a reasonable uh, approach that covers both sides of the equation. And as we get to the uh, uh, <clears throat> further down the road with respect to the site plan that we're gonna hear or public comment on tonight, uh, I think it's even more important that that due diligence be factored in in the event that the project significantly change it or another one significantly changes those assumptions exactly okay 
Okay, uh, want to call the roll, Kathy, please? Commissioner Henry? Aye. Commissioner Berg? Aye. Chairman Lay? Aye. Commissioner Culbertson? Aye. Commissioner Karras? Aye. Five uh, gays, no nays, motion passes. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Um, why don't we take a four or five minute break and then we'll get to the, because uh, uh, I would expect there's going to be a lot of testimony. At least we've got uh, eight or nine here already and I would expect there's more of these uh, slips out there as well. So we'll collect those and be back here promptly at uh, uh, 750 according to that clock in the back of the room. We will uh, we'll resume uh, our agenda, uh, moving to uh, item number four, the introduction and preliminary information for the uh, Laurel and Western Avenue redevelopment. Uh, we're gonna hear a presentation from uh, Focus Development Inc, uh, 20 minutes. Uh, I would uh, ask at this point whether or not members of the commission have any ex parte contacts or conflicts of interest on this agenda item? No. Seeing none, uh, we will proceed. Um, I would like uh, those of you who have submitted slips and in addition to those who might wish to testify to please stand at this time and I would like to uh, <coughs> swear you in. Chairman, since this isn't a public hearing, you don't need I'm to sorry. do any. Thank the, you. This is just comment and questions tonight. Thank you, Kathy. <laughs> Too used to my uh, group notes. Okay. Okay, uh, Mr. Anderson and Ms. Cole, who will be making the presentation? Please proceed. Good evening. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, members of the Plan Commission and members of the community who have come, down, come out this evening to learn more about our project. We're very excited to be here tonight, and we'll try to keep the presentation brief. As Kathy mentioned, the primary objective of this evening's presentation is to learn more about what the community concerns are, what the Plan Commission concerns are. Any questions, any, anything? Before we begin the presentation, Tim Anderson, our president and CEO, will come up and say a couple words about focused development, and you can welcome him now. My name is Tim Anderson. I'm the owner and CEO of Focus Development, and we are really excited to be here. Uh, we are um, uh, welcoming the, the, this part of the process and understanding the community input into our proposed development. Just a little background on myself. I was a uh, architect for 10 years. I went to IIT in School of Architecture, graduated, got a job, and was an architect for 10 years. And then I went to work for a architect developer contractor for six years. And then 21 years ago, a little over that, I, I started Focus Development. And our first project happened to be the laurels in Lake Forest, almost directly across the street from this site. So it's ironic we're back here talking about another development opportunity in uh, Lake Forest. Um, I founded Focus in 1993. Uh, we've, we've had several successful developments in the North Shore. In the western suburbs, Oak Park, Evanston, Winneka, Highland Park, and now in the city as well. Um, we have extensive re residential experience ranging from anything from townhomes to high rises. And uh, uh, projects can range in anything from $5 million to $100 million. So we have a broad range of experience. One of the things I really like about our development company is that we use an integrated model, that is, we have development and construction both in-house. And I like that because I think it del delivers a higher quality project, uh, timely and uh, responsive to customer needs, as well as creating high accountability. 
Everyone on our design team that you'll see tonight has got experience here working in Lake Forest and with each other. Uh, the focus staff, our project team, and access to strong financial partners underpins our ability to perform uh, the de development you will see tonight. And we have extensive experience both with TIF and with public-private partnerships in communities from Oak Park, Evanston, Skokie, a number of different communities that we've worked in. Uh, so we really thank you for the opportunity. I'm going to have our development manager, Christine Cobb, uh, walk through the development and then introduce some of our other project team members. Thank you. We've talked a little bit this evening about the opportunity that's before us all. As you can see on the slide and as Lee's remarks earlier, this has been a redevelopment target for the city in multiple strategic plans and comprehensive plans in the past and was the, also um, the focus of past planning efforts including the 2007 to 2009 planning effort overseen by the plan commission um, where extensive input was gathered about the site from the surrounding community and development charrettes were performed to see what would be palatable for everyone. Last year, the city released a request for qualifications and a request for proposals for this 10-acre site. And uh, again, that RFP and RFQ was informed by the recommendations that came out of past planning efforts for the site itself. Overall, the city's vision for this area, as was earlier alluded to, included connectivity for pedestrians and vehicles, integrating this site into the surrounding neighborhood and really serving as a connection for people in the north side of East Lake Forest to come down towards the city's heart at Market Square. Another priority was balancing density and open space, two priorities for the city, in addition to quality, maintaining the quality standards that Lake Forest prides itself on. In responding to the RFP and RFQ, we assembled the team that Tim discussed all of us with past experience in Lake Forest and many of us experience working with each other. We think it's an exceptional team. And in creating our vision, we reviewed not only the existing conditions of the site and the city's priorities for planning that were embedded in the RFQ and RFP to arrive at the vision we'll share with you this evening. The existing conditions of the site were discussed earlier this evening. Again, it's the former municipal services site. It's been vacant since 2008 and thereabouts. There's re environmental remediation needs. There's poor soils. Um, there, are some, there are some passive uses that are currently on the site, including storage, uh, passive storage, as one of the community members correctly pointed out. If you step away from the site and you broaden your lens to include the surrounding neighborhood, you see a variety of residential and commercial building types, including single family, multifamily, commercial and retail. You see a variety of heights and densities, um, all things that we wanted to be respectful of as we started crafting our vision for what the site could bear, keeping in mind what its adjacencies are. And then lastly, a large priority for redeveloping this site was sensitivity around some of the existing uses and um, open space um, benefits that the site offers, including Franklin Park, which is in the northeast corner of the site, a uh, berm that was provided uh, on the northwest corner of the site to screen vehicles for the municipal service site, and finally, the historic oak tree in the southwest corner of the site, which is a gem for Lake Forest. <coughs> Using the development parameters outlined in the RFP, the planning and design standards issued by the city, and with a preliminary understanding of what some areas of concern are for the community around the site, we arrived at our proposed site plan. We've integrated three different residential product types onto this 10-acre site. <laughs> single family homes on the western lot line, condominiums on the interior site and on the south border of Laurel Avenue, and luxury apartments along Western Avenue and Franklin Place. The scale of the buildings were designed to respect the existing adjacent heights in the neighborhood as we mirror single family homes to the west of the site and three story height precedents on the north and south borders of the site. To address the city's parameters around access, we created a new road 
to provide north-south vehicular access through the site, connecting Laurel and Franklin, as well as a number of public walkways through the gardens to activate the site with pedestrian space. Preserving the green space around the historic oak tree, revitalizing the Franklin Park area, and adding significant green space to the southeast corner of the site. The total site is 65% open space. We were able to achieve that number by dropping all of our parking for the multifamily housing out of sight and underground. The residential program highlighted in the attached, as I mentioned, includes single family, luxury apartments, and condominiums. The luxury apartments will be a newcomer to the city of Lake Forest. They have one, two, and three bedroom units larger than typically seen by apartment standards in order to cater to the Lake Forest market. They are um, they include a small single-story amenity clubhouse that has not only on-site amenities, but importantly, on-site management that will be there 24-7. And the units themselves have condo quality finishes that will be built and maintained to investment level standards. So there will be a significant amount of investment going into this product on the front end and throughout its operation as it continues to thrive as a luxury development. There is an 18 story, uh, excuse me, an 18 unit and a 24 unit condominium building contemplated on the site, <laughs> which will have two and three bedrooms. And uh, it's the first new condo product since the recession. Lastly, we've provided for 12 single family cottages, which are cluster home uh, attached and detached single family products. They'll all have first floor masters, which are particularly appealing to a move down buyer, and they provide maintenance free living. So you'll, it'll be a similar association to what you find at a condominium, but available in a single family format. We've provided a couple preliminary elevations so that you can see what the streetscape and character of the development looks like along Western Avenue and along Laurel Avenue to get a sense of the character and scale and relative building heights of what we're proposing. I'd like to invite Carrie Woolabin Mead from Mariani Landscaping to the podium to say a few words about our vision for landscape and streetscape, followed by a few words on architecture by Larry Booth from Booth Hansen. Well, as Christine already mentioned, we have a development that's proposed to be 65% open space, so that makes it a lot of fun for us in the landscape world. Uh, so this is designed around English garden formatting with formal access lines, different garden rooms. There's actually four larger parks in the, in the development. You can see in the middle there's an open main lawn corridor. Thank you. Right in here. And that would serve as a heart to this development where people can gather, serve the apartment buildings, somewhere you could go. There's a swimming pool right off the health club facility there. Um, there's a park for the single family, family residents. Here's our oak tree. And so that's the green space she mentioned around there. And then the Franklin Park corner, which will have new walkways and improvements there. <laughs> Right there. We also have many park, uh, pocket park size parks and spaces throughout the development, uh, areas that will provide for dog runs and amenities that the people living in the developments will want to use and those of you crossing through the development will want to use. So there's walkways and connectivity all the way through, uh, so you'll be able to walk through and enjoy these different spaces. Um, we are changing the parking and adding parking along the street front here uh, for public and continuing the look and the improvements that have already been done down the street. So really, this is not a gated community. It's really a, a community open to the public. It's supposed to be an enhancement for everyone um, and encourage you to go through and enjoy all these garden spaces. 
uh, just some styling images so you can see the types of materials and finishes we're talking about. Obviously, the lighting has already been set. We want to continue on with the Lake Forest style lanterns. Uh, cobble streets for our main street through here. And then the plant material, we are going to be using a palette of native plants and a diverse community of plants, but they're going to be arranged in a little bit more formal setting. Uh, and I think those are my main points. I turn it over to Larry. Thank you. Oh, you got a pointer? <laughs> I'm Larry Booth. I'm the architect planner for uh, this project here and uh, from Booth Hanson Architects. And I don't have a whole lot to say um, because the star of the show is the garden. This is, <coughs> when you look at Lake Forest, what's the great tradition? What's the great value? <coughs> it's the gardens. And so what we, set out to do was to create a great garden. And that's why 65% of the site is open and landscaped and treed and great Mariani landscaping <laughs> work. Uh, the center space is almost the length of a football field. So it's the great lawn, which is a great American tradition. It goes back to Thomas Jefferson. Uh, the architecture, how do you, ch you change it? Okay. The architecture really goes back as well to Thomas Jefferson. You think of the University of Virginia with a common red brick that knits the whole complex together, some great trim around the windows, some ornamental railings, and there you have the University of Virginia, the great lawn, and we're looking back at that American tradition of simple four square buildings, beautiful brickwork, great craftsmanship, great proportion, and three stories or in, I mean, it, there's a three story building, and then there's a four story building with a uh, slate roof. So the, the view will be a high quality, consistent with Lake Forest architecture. And one more. And if, if uh, Lake Forest College has some high buildings, it's okay, I think, because they have open space to go with it. And this is what we, we thought the trade-off was better to group the buildings, get the parking off, out of view, no parking lots, no surface parking, some guest parking on the periphery right off the streets, <clears throat> but basically it's a garden. And that's what we think will attract people. And we're not going to try to wow them with some architectural fantasies. We want to go back to the tradition of early America, simple buildings set in a great landscape. So that's our story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> Thank you. That concludes our presentation this evening. We welcome and appreciate any feedback from the community or the plan commission, and just again extend our thanks for the opportunity to be before you this evening. Thank you very much. Um, I think in the interest of, of all of you who have come, we'll move right to the public comment uh, period uh, of our meeting this evening on this matter, and then um, after that occurs, then we will move to uh, comments, suggestions, whatever, <clears throat> from members of the uh, commission. This is not, as I said before, up for action tonight. The sole purpose is to get the initial presentation out here, to get the public comments back. You may have a lot of questions, but the intent is not to answer questions tonight, but to, in effect, say to the, uh, <clears throat> to the developer, uh, at the point at which you come back, uh, you should have, uh, you should be able to well address the public comment 
testimony that we heard here tonight, along with any input provided by the uh, uh, by the commissioners themselves. So, with that, we will start. Uh, the first person to speak is Stephen Bruin, 1261 Burr Oak Road, and following Steve will be Jim Warfield. Uh, Jim, you'll be on deck. Sure. <clears throat> and I might add too that. Uh, uh, if your comments, for those of you who are going to speak, have already been stated by another speaker, uh, you can simply state your agreement with the previous comments, and there's no need to repeat them. Also, I would request that you please be respectful of other speakers and all points of view, especially if they don't <clears throat> agree with, uh, uh, with your own. Uh, please refrain from clapping or criticizing other speakers. Okay, my name is Stephen Bruin, and I've been attending these public meetings since 2007 when this entire project started. And there have been a variety of points that most of the residents of that area have made consistently um, over these last seven years, and some have been incorporated and some have not been. And I'm going to talk about what I consider to be two very important aspects that have never really been taken into consideration, or they may have been taken into consideration, but it's never been reflected in any of the renderings or drawings that I've seen, okay? Uh, one of them is what's gonna happen to Franklin Place. Uh, I live on Burr Oak, which is, as you go down that street there to the right, turns into Burr Oak. But this is a lovely street. This is a picture I took this fall of how the street looks in the fall. And, and my suspicion is that if Franklin is widened, as it's been proposed, all of those trees are gonna go, and I think there are many, many people here that remember the incidents that took place many years ago with regards to a resident cutting down all their trees and Lake Forest passed ordinances restricting that. These trees all fall within that guideline and they have been there for a long time and it would be a shame if we were to lose them. The second aspect that has not really been considered very much and perhaps that is not in such great focus but is the park on Franklin Place and Western. Uh, I understand that uh, Mariani has taken consideration in that park, but I think the improvement has basically been to eliminate it for all intents and purposes. And it would be a tragedy if we lost that open space. So my position is not oppose the development because I think we need the development and it would, what they're suggesting for the most part is very nice, much better than what I've seen in the past, but I really would like to see something that takes in consideration Franklin Place, leaving it intact, and then also the park at Franklin and Western. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you very much, Mr. Bruin. <clears throat> Mr. Warfield, and following Mr. Warfield will be Jan Gibson. Okay. My name is Jim Warfield, 140 East Franklin Place. Uh, my concern has to do with the process that we are going about and I'm fearful that the city council is going to allow variances to the current code in order to reach some of the goals, financial goals, that the city wants to achieve. A sale price has not been set for that property, and I'm concerned that the developer that has been selected will develop that land in such a way that will yield a desirable sale price for the city. It seems a little backwards. So please do not uh, cause a variance from any of the current code, whether it be setback requirements or height requirements. The other comment that I'm uh, concerned about is given the uh, number of residents that appear on that property, uh, it really is a concern that there is not adequate egress or access directly from Western Avenue. That you are creating a much different traffic pattern when you're using an exit point and a rather heavy exit point as currently presented that goes on to Franklin uh, Place. So if some investigation to going and having immediate access to, Frank, uh, to uh, Western Avenue I think should be considered. 
The other that I am concerned is the groundwater effect that such a large footprint would have on the surrounding basements and to the underground garage parking that is immediately to the north. And I don't know if any studies have been done regarding the groundwater uh, for that site plan as currently proposed. And uh, last but not least is um, looking at the ratio of condominiums to apartments. And is that in the city's best interest uh, in terms of the use of this um, acreage? I'm very much in favor of having the development plan process continue and to have this 10-acre slot uh, a lot developed. Thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> Uh, Jan Gibson, and then after Jan will be, uh, um, I can't read the first name. <laughs> Is it Irene Corzos? Diane. Diane. Or Diane, I'm yeah. sorry. Diane, you'll follow Jan. Thank you. Jan, welcome. Thank you. Oh, oh my goodness. goodness. Is she okay? Yeah. I'm Jan Gibson, 59 East Franklin Place. I own one of the four homes bordering the west side of the Laurel Western property. I've never been against the redevelopment of this property. I like to see it and to be developed. And when we discussed the proposals in the late 1990s, uh, when the plans for Market Square North came before the city, um, I, I spoke out about the, at those plans then, and that was in 1999. I dragged out my plans again, or my talk again for this one, and I keep dragging it out, it seems. Howard Kerr was the mayor then, and that was nearly 16 years ago, uh, about five administrations ago. My concerns haven't changed, um, and I don't think this is right yet. I think we'll get it right, but it's not quite there. Um, I have concerns with the traffic flow and parking issues, scaling density and setbacks, compatibility with the neighborhood, solid design and quality construction and materials. Uh, those are my concerns. I would say retail, but I think I threw that one out because we have dealt with it, and also the green space, which I love to hear about the 65% green space, although I'm not sure it's in the right spot. Um, with regard to traffic, uh, it's a possibility of 175 cars times two people, um, 350 cars, and if you take that down, let's say 250 to 300 cars, that's a lot of cars in this neighborhood. It's already pretty crowded. Add the existing parking difficulties right now at the grill and the whiskey bar, and you basically have a traffic um, parking nightmare. I'm concerned, as Jim is, with the ingress and egress. Uh, it defies logic having a road go from Laurel to Franklin. Really, it should be two roads going right directly to Western. All roads lead to Western anyway. Um, when drivers exit out into Franklin Place, there are which is obviously going to be widened, they're going to be going east to reach Western, or they're going to go north up where Oak and then east on Thomas to reach Western. Why not just go directly to Western? Um, it just makes no sense. The, uh, I'm afraid that also if you exit Laurel, uh, your 90 percent of those are going to go to Western anyway. So um, it's all basically right there, and I can, I'm wondering if eventually we're we're going to be afraid that we'll have another traffic light at Laurel and Western, just a few yards from the one already at Woodland and Western. Um, scaling and density and setbacks. The building heights, um, and I don't know what those are yet, can really loom over walkers and bikers. All you have to do is go north on Western, and on the east side of the street you see um, the setback is nothing, and you, have, you feel like a wall. Um, eventually, this could be the Great Wall of Western because uh, you have some property there that's really fairly close to, the, um, to, to Western anyway. Notice the setbacks at Crystal Point. They really are far away from, or some of them are far away from Western. Um, I don't know what the foot height is, uh, but I would consider recommending a pole with the red flag at the top. And you put that pole showing the red flag is at the, where the peak of the building is, the tallest building is, so we can all see the height, realistically, the height of what that peak is going to be of the tallest building. Let the public see it. 
compatibility with the neighborhood. Um, the pocket park that we had, um, or that we have now, it's not gone yet, uh, is used quite often. And the reason it's used quite often is not just from the people who live right around it, it's from people who are uh, many blocks away. They live in Lake Forest, but they come over to the pocket park for yoga and for croquet and um, all different kinds of things. You do see people there in wheelchairs and you see dog walkers and so forth, but they're not just people right in that, that tight area. Uh, I'm afraid that if you start using the, the green, in other words, put that green, the green right now that you have is really in within the buildings, you're going to exclude the people from the other areas. And the people right now don't feel excluded. They've used the park. So um, maybe they might use that park in the southeast corner that you've designed, but they'll not use that green space, which is what a football field in length. Um, it'd be nice to have people have it more inclusive to the public. If, it, if that's what it's designed as. Uh, with quality and with regard to quality and construction, um, I know Larry can do this well. Um, we can't cut corners on building materials and fenestration, and the details have to be there. This is an important structure. So after 16 years, we have to get this correct. Um, let's revise and do it right. Thank you. I'm Diane Karzis. I live at 140 East Franklin and I've lived in Lake Forest for 55 years. Much of what has been said is exactly what I would have said, but I will simply add that as all of the roads will lead to Western Avenue, they will also use our private road. Crystal Point has a private road connecting Franklin and Thomas into the, the six buildings. Uh, that road will become another open bypass for traffic. And so we will be confronted with doing something about a road we have to have. It cannot be closed because it enters into the garages and the buildings. Uh, it will have to be in some way monitored, which will be very unfortunate. Uh, so I would, I would leave that as just one further comment about all roads are going to lead to Western Avenue in one way or another. So you need to consider several other opportunities for en uh, entrance exit onto w Western itself. Thank you very much. Uh, next person is Phelps Langtree, and then following <coughs> that individual will be um, Beth Napoli. Uh, my name is Phelps Langtree, 1230 Northwestern. I'm in Crystal Point also. And I just was curious. One of the things under density and open space is a statement that the requirements of the city's in inclusionary housing ordinance must be met through an incorporation of affordable and moderately priced units as defined by the city code. And I've never been able to get a definition from the city the, of, of affordable. <laughs> you know, the, the building across the street from us, 1351, there have been some, there's a condo that's on the market now for $109,000 and another one for $154,000. And I'd like to know what's affordable. Can someone define it? And in this plan, I assume, and, and I'd like to some, someone show me which of the residences is, are they considered affordable. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Langley. <clears throat> Following uh, Ms. Napoli will be uh, Carol Ackerman. Hello, hi, I'm Beth Napoli and I live, uh, my husband Matthew and I have been here 35 years as of March uh, next year. And I live in a house like Jan Gibson's. Jan and I talked a lot about this as she said, we have, this is, I feel this is my albatross. I have spoken on everything developed around us and now this new proposal for 175 units will be truly in my backyard. And I think that we need to consider as we have said, we've talked about Western Avenue repeatedly, Western. I, I, by the way, I'm not against development. I think we need to step back about 
density, about height, and some of the design. I feel, looking at the black and white sheet that we were mailed, I thought, everything's falling off the page. There's so much going on. And um, as I said, all right, here's, I, I have lists of questions and comments. I'm not against development, as I said, but I think we need to be very careful. Western is where things should, the majority should enter and leave that complex on Western. My address is 58 East Laurel, but I'm off the street. I can't see as Nan and um, John Remington. My husband and I cannot see Laurel from our house or our garden. And it's some people have said, oh, you have an unlisted house. And that's been fun for 35 years. Not against the development, as I said, next door. But I think we need to be extremely careful about the size. And hearing that the four flat with its roof is as high as City Hall. There was a meeting, one of the many meetings years ago, I was ill, but my husband went and they asked for comments and there was a four flat planned on that same corner of Laurel and Western. And the four flat, my husband said at the meeting, are we building a lighthouse <laughs> here? And he said people in the audience applauded. So I think the idea of the red flag is a good one. That's way up, the blind spots, all the things. Um, so as I said, I'm on Laurel, and right next to us would be the single family homes, and that's lovely. Then there's that wider road. That's on Laurel, and that's on Franklin Place. So Franklin Place is almost a cul-de-sac right there. And on Laurel, our quaint little street, which is one block long, and leads to Green Bay Road, as well as Western Avenue. People access on and off uh, Green Bay, people will have a very difficult time. 175 units, if everyone has two cars, which today many do, that's 350 cars. And a lot of them will be exiting on Laurel, but they need to be going to Western Avenue, which has a lot of activity. I guess one of my last queries is, what about that sports complex that's on Western Avenue? Will everybody be able to use that? Um, that's, that could be a very bad traffic spot, and that is the only place for people to be dropped off, is at the sports center. No place else has a sidewalk, a place to walk. Um, and I guess lastly, too, that green in the center, I think that looks lovely, except if you're standing in that green and you look around, there are 12 stories or floors of housing that you can look at. And I think that's a lot for that place. So I think there are lots of considerations. Many of the things, as Jan said, these are things that we've thought about and thought about and talked about repeatedly. And many of those concerns are still there. Thanks. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Following uh, Ms. Ackerman is Pat Kammerer. Coral Ackerman, 1260 Western. Um, I want to just mention or, or reiterate what Steve said uh, re regarding the trees that are on Franklin. I also want to add that I think that berm should be saved in that little park on uh, Franklin and Western, which is already small to me should be enlarged, not shrunken. Um, I would prefer really this whole property become park. It would be nice to have a dog park in the area. Wouldn't it be nice to have a community garden with the soil cleaned up? That's what would be really great. Thank you. Hi, I'm Pat Kammerer. And I've lived here so long, I know almost not everybody, but a lot of people. And um, let's see, I've lived here since 1967. I live at 1361, a state line. Somebody has already addressed the question of what is affordable. So that was my first point, and I, I don't know, I guess you don't get answers tonight. You just throw up questions, is that it? We'll get them later, yes. Okay, <coughs> and then, um, I guess the price point generally, or what, what is gonna range from of these proposed construction? 
all the different types where what's the price point um, it sounds like it has to come up it has to relate to the TIF district that it has to come up with at least 30 million dollars with the taxes in 23 years if I understand it correctly um, what is the population total when all these places are built uh, I don't know I wonder if there are going to be a lot of children expected that's an, these are all questions now I have a suggestion because parking seems to be a huge problem as it is all over Lake Forest the city lacks public parking and I am going to suggest that you save a little piece of that land all that acreage and build a city garage that's several stories high and it seems to me because everybody that's tried to find out where in the world you can park if you want to go to the grill or you want to go to any of those places you're sneaking around trying to maybe even park in somebody's driveway uh, it's a problem it's one right here and 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 you should put up you should have built it a long time ago on this parking lot behind city hall actually so anyway that's it those are my suggestions and my questions thank you very much thank you uh, that uh, completes the registration slips that we've received to comment uh, I would invite anybody else who hasn't signed a registration slip who does wish to speak or ask uh, questions that they would like to have answered at a later point uh, please come up I'm Mary Lynn Firth, 1350 Northwestern, 48-year resident. And I really echo all that I have heard, so I'm not going to go through it again. It's been well-spoken. I am a former resident of Burr Oak and a current resident of uh, Crystal Point. And I have a sadness because Burr Oak when we were living in there, and I think still living in there, was a quiet, family-oriented little street. And um, I, I think I'm really opposed to the breaking through uh, between Franklin and Laurel for the same reasons that have already been given, the traffic, the density, all of that. So again, I wish you all luck, and uh, it's a beautiful plan. I just wish it were in another state. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <coughs> Go ahead. Uh, my name is Kevin Carden. I live at 275 East Woodland Road. I echo the comments of the previous residents that have spoken. Um, I, fail, I would add or stress that I fail to see how a four-story building so close to Western Avenue is within the character of Lake Forest or how it's beneficial to Lake Forest. I clearly see how it's detrimental to residents, especially me. Um, I also ask that it be considered that the single-family homes being considered for the site follow the same diversity of architecture that's expected of other single family home developments or improvements that are done and also a similar level of uh, quality of architecture. I also ask that the development disclose the low income housing or affordable, how, uh, affordable housing that's contemplated for the site and also clearly to define what's considered low income or affordable as has previously been requested. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Again, uh, 12, uh, 1260 Northwestern, or no, 1230. We know where to find you. 1230. <laughs> um, I'm not a hydraulics engineer, but <coughs> where Western Avenue is down, goes down low, we have terrible water problems there when there's heavy rains. Uh, Western Avenue floods all the way across. 
And I know that the private lane or the private driveway that Crystal Point has is just, we, we maintain that ourselves and it's asphalt, but I've taken pictures of that flooded over. There's been six, six or eight inches of water in that. And I don't know what kind of a, what effect this development will have on our hydraulics, uh, on our flooding, but uh, I hope it'll be to uh, take some of this in consideration. Uh, I, I, people for years have th indicated that there wasn't enough drainage from the low spot on Western Avenue toward, toward the lake to get rid of all that storm water. And I don't know what, to, uh, what, what this uh, building, this, this pro uh, project is gonna have the other effect on that. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Other comments or questions? I'm Richard Cottrell. I don't think I have to introduce myself again. I don't want to trash this plan completely, but I would take the condominium building on Laurel and duplicate it on Franklin, which would open up the corner that you all seem to want to save and then reduce the four-story structure to a minimum of three. Um, I really question the need for all these rental units with the transient behavior you're going to have with people moving in and out, probably not being there for more than two, maybe three years, whereas a, for a resident living there in our building, I would say the average person is there 10 years. Uh, so I would want to minimize the number of rental units Limit it to Laurel Avenue. I don't want to get in a fight with Tim. I said it was as high as the clock tower. I think I said it was almost as high as the clock tower in Market Square. And I think if you go look, instead of putting um, an imaginary red flag, just go measure four stories on the clock tower and then put a roof above those four stories. And I think you'll almost be as high as the clock tower. And I think that's absurd. <coughs> Uh, so if you can make it work with one rental building, which I'm not sure you even need at all, have three condominium buildings and open up the corner uh, that people want to res uh, preserve at Franklin and Western, I think you've got a better shot at keeping people happy. Thank you, Mr. Cottrell. Don't be shy. Uh, I would emphasize too that uh, uh, you're not limited to your comments this evening. This matter, will, I would expect, will be back before the plan commission, and uh, <clears throat> so you'll have ample opportunity to uh, uh, to speak and comment. Uh, I would expect probably the next time we get this, there will be an open formal public hearing. Uh, and uh, if this follows the, uh, <clears throat> and this, this process was designed for a purpose, because if you, the process seems to work best here in Lake Forest. When we get these informational presentations, we get the comments from people, the suggestions, the crit criticisms, and so forth. It gives the <clears throat> developer an opportunity to address those and come back. And uh, it's my hope that we get as good an outcome with this project or a similar project as we got with our hospital. That, that process, that went through a very uh, lengthy public input process. I think the result was, was superb, will be superb for this community. And, and my only hope as chairman is that we can uh, <clears throat> come up with something here that uh, uh, gets, if not universal acclaim from the community, pretty doggone close to it. So I, I really appreciate everyone coming out this evening, and I would uh, strongly urge you all to, uh, to stay tuned and uh, keep active in this project. Um, let's see, Kathy, did you want to have any comments? I was just going to uh, offer a comment about notice. If you received mailed notice of this hearing, you will continue to receive mailed notice. If you did not receive mailed notice and want to, please let me know and we'll make sure to get you on the list. Um, I don't think 
from the staff perspective, this information is very helpful when we get the technical information, uh, the detailed plans in from focus development. Your comments will help guide staff review. Uh, we will come back to you, as the chairman said, um, at a public hearing, and we will at that time uh, try and directly respond to all of your comments and questions that were raised. Kathy, should we give the petitioner one last uh, <laughs> opportunity here this evening, if they so choose? They're fine. Pass? They're passing. Let me just say we're, we're thankful for uh, the input tonight. I think it was very informational for us, you know, and uh, we'll be back in January. Good. Thank you so much. Okay.